Friday Night Live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Friday Night Live. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the blueprint, the basic metrics of understanding a wealth plan, understanding the importance of doing something, understanding how money really works, and understanding that each and every one of you are following a wealth plan. Might not be great, or might be great, but I hope by the end of this video, you've learned something, you understand your trajectory, and you understand how to empower yourself with the right finance and make your money work harder for you. I know there's a lot of clickbaits out there, Sean, we see this all the time, get rich quick. Amazon drop shipping, I promise you, we're not gonna sell you any shipping course. In fact, I'm not gonna sell you any course. Um, but today we're gonna teach you some very practical information that is real, that you can imply. And my only suggestion for this podcast or video, however you're consuming this, is take notes, um, put in your numbers as you learn uh, or go get through our discussion. And if it makes you curious, touch base with Mark or myself or Sean and let's see if we can help you out tonight. Now, before we get started, as we always do, to my right, I've got Sean, and to his right, we have got Mark. So Sean, how has your week been? Well, Kesh, I love this question so much. I look, <laughs> look forward to it so much every single week, and I can't believe we're already here. It seems like we did Friday Night Live only about a couple of days ago. But uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been chaotic. Uh, it has. But this week, in chaotic in such a good way, because no one's waiting on me for anything for a change. Damn. Which is, um, which is Are we the celebrating first. the end Impressive. of the year? Yeah. Are we celebrating the end of the year? Has Sean finally <laughs> gone through his to-do ooh 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 list? <laughs> well, you, well, well, you, <laughs> you helped me with a massive portion of my to-do list this morning with a with a software hack, and I'm really appreciative. Mate, of it. it was what, ladies and gentlemen, it was a actually what? I'll charge fifty grand for that software hack. Yeah, it was fine. one click, and we took Sean's problems away. We'll tell you a little bit about that moving forward. Only one click. Mark, how's your week been? You boys may know the answer to this, and it's been an absolute crack. Ah, oh, we love it. It has been a cracker. I, I reckon we've got to start calling him Cracker Mark. Mark. Cracker Jack. Cracker, cracker Jack. Jack. Sponsor this video. Now, um, <laughs> give us an affiliate link for Woolies. I don't know. Mate, we got, we got, producer Anna has put pressure on us that we need to get sponsors. Otherwise, we will lose our camera gear. So, ladies and gentlemen. Got to the end of the year. If you've got, if you, if you work for a large corporation <laughs> who would like a banner somewhere in this thing, a running banner, we can start selling. You know what? We can start selling some. It. Yeah, hundred percent. Every part of the screen can be sold. That's a good idea. We can wear T-shirts. We can do that sort of stuff. Hey, if you guys have creative ideas, let us know. But without further delay, today's topic is understanding the metrics, the blueprint of people's default financial future, and it is quite scary. So there's a little rumor that I would love Mark actually today for you to confirm is I've heard that a large majority, so I don't know the exact number, mm. I'm sure you can give us those numbers, but a large majority of Australians are gonna retire bum broke. Like I'm not talking like, oh, you know, middle class, I'm talking broke. <laughs> I'm talking so broke you can't buy medication. I'm talking so broke that you're eating, living off tuna cans mm. and eating cat food <laughs> for, for a living. So that is pretty scary. Um, and what I'd love to know from you is you, you speak to so many people every single day. All of us do, but you particularly um, have a knack like we know. So ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't watched the previous episode, Mark is the nicest guy. He is empathetic. He loves people, but he has the courage to have an honest conversation and tough conversations that maybe your friends and family don't want to have with you because they're quite confronting. Um, so Mark, in your conversations, you have a really good way of explaining to people how their default future really works. So for our lovely audience today, can you just give us a little bit of insight into why are people retiring broke and how many, what percentage of people actually are retiring broke? I can, yeah. Um, and I guess what I want to start off with is the, uh, a pyramid. Right. Have mm. you guys seen this before? Or the pyramid. The pyramid. No, no, I'm sure you guys it. might understand we've, this, but we've understood. these people might not. So let's pretend we're all one big family. Sure. So, so it's about the pyramid. pyramid. I'm gonna, no, no, no. For this episode shot, we got to act like we don't know Jack. And we've got to put ourselves in the audience shoes. You don't know Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack. Is that, is that, right. Can we get Mate, if Cracker Jack is not going to be let's here, we're going to go to Jack. 
Um, but, but, but what I want to do, guys, I want to I want to jump in here, and yeah, yeah, I want to show you what's going on quickly with a, a pyramid of, of uh, from our last uh, consensus we did back in 2016. Beautiful. Um, and then I want to show you a couple other things, and this is just going to give you a bit more of a realistic understanding of exactly what's going on, because this is not made up by me. This is sourced from the Australian Bureau of Statistics as well. well okay? Beautiful, me. So draw it out for us. Look, what I'll do is a, a quick little pyramid here. What have I got? Oh, you can just swipe across like a page, and there we go. Cool. And you can put your palm on it, Mark, because it's not going to bite. Okay. Like a piece uh, of paper. How do I get a pen? I there you go. You're already pen. on the pen. Yeah. So let's, this is our bottom of the pyramid. Now, this is where 70% of people retire broke. Okay. Now, I think that's a pretty big portion. Now, these are people over the age of 65 years. Mm. Okay. Mm. Over the age of 65 years of age. Now, 7%. These people here retired on a different asset class and that was superannuation mm. okay now superannuation i like to do a quick little uh, quick sketch so yeah, if we course. say 65 years of age is that retirement age correct now life expectancy would you guys say 86 85 86, 85, 86, 85, 86, 85, 86 well, let's, yeah. let's just go well, for us three probably 65 <laughs> 155 mate given we're, we're, given we're, the risks we're immortal, take immortal so <laughs> look, we know. We, let's just call it eighty-five, just for clean numbers. Just, just to live long. I'm going vegan. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll say 20, 20 years of, of uh, retired living. Mm -hmm. Twenty years of retired mm -hmm. living. Now the average superannuation. Um, I think we were discussing that the other day. It's about four hundred thousand. But let's be generous today and say five hundred thousand is the average maturity. Yep. So five hundred k by the time we retire gives us twenty five thousand per annum. Okay. So how much can, can I'm going to work something out while you're doing that because. People like when you throw up big numbers, twenty five grand, this and that. I don't, I don't, I don't know if people are getting context because people understand maths differently. Mm -hmm. So twenty five thousand dollars a year for the rest of my till till I die. Pretty much. That works out to be about four hundred and eighty dollars a week. Mm. Which is probably enough to get the train to the city and back. Mate, in twenty forty. I'm certain. No joke. I, I I'm, I'm pretty sure I spend more on tolls. <laughs> yeah, that's right. for sure. If you take away the Netflix bill, the gym membership, you're not really left with eating anything apart from a, a pack of noodles. Oh, yeah. there's going to be Mr. Excuses. Thing. I don't go to gym. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Excuses is going to say he doesn't watch Netflix either. He pirates. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So please, please don't pirate this. We don't pirate it. It's free anyway. You don't need to pirate it. <laughs> Going back to the early 2000s. So, look, that's, that's, that's 25,000 per annum, let's call it on average. Now, these people here in the, uh, the government pension period here or field, these people are getting paid approximately twenty-eight and a half to twenty-nine thousand mm. for a married couple. So we'll just put twenty-eight point five k. Now I do apologise, writing is a bit messy, but I've never written on these. Before. Oh mate, you're beautiful. Now anyway, twenty-two percent. These people here are our lovely friends who basically took too much more than they could actually chew. Mm. Right? They've taken on too much debt. They might have to work not because they want to, but because they have to. Right? So would you say? And sorry to just jump in yeah. here. So Mike context of debt in that scenario and i'm thinking here correct me if i'm wrong mm. uh, is people with massive mortgages massive mortgages would probably be the biggest part of that 22 percent. because if i'm not wrong i think as of today 36 to 44 percent of household income in sydney mm -hmm. alone is just going to pay off the mortgage so if you're basically a partner mm. one partner is going to work to pay the mortgage essentially mm. so that's scary to live like that for 30 years 100%. absolutely and now that leaves us with obviously one last part which is that one percent which, mm. whoop, I don't know what we've done there. Just select the pen. Yep. There we go. 1%. So this is 1% here. Now, this is where our independently wealthy are. Mm. Now, when I go through this all the time, I'm not sure if you guys, I've told you guys about it, but there was actually a client of mine, who I won't name, who told me that the 1%, what they did to get there was that they married into a rich family. Oh my goodness. Uh, thought, that well, is classic. I remember yeah. this story, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. jrmatrimonial.com.au uh, <laughs> We have rich families. We have families that are trying to get rich. Why not combine the two? Well, that's what I did say to her. I said, look, Wedding if, you can, bills. if you can teach me... <laughs> I did say to her, if you can teach me exactly how to do that... Strategy-wise, <laughs> what's the strategy? I'm going to stop this now. I'm going to listen to you. No, but in all seriousness, we know that these these people here look we don't know what exactly they did invest into i think there's you know there's a million things you can invest into these days but as we always say they had a plan number one but they also took action all right but i don't want to harp on too much about that i just wanted to point that out a little bit there but now if i keep moving on i want to show you guys a quick little bucket analogy have you guys done this before maybe mm -hmm. you have but the audience might not oh this is a very guys i'm just going to step in here while 
um, Mark's getting the basics up, but the bucket analogy is, it's it's not, I don't want you guys to sit here and look at this, this changed my life when I looked at it, to be honest, when I looked at this analogy for the first time, because I don't want you guys to take this lightly. This, this is your life. This is actually your hard earned money and your time. Mm. And there's one thing all three of us know, well, everyone should know, one thing you can never buy back in life is time. Correct. 100%. So please, that is such an important the bucket analogy. Go well, I'll, go, I'll go through this one real quick with you guys anyway. Yep. So uh, when we look back at people, uh, we look back across from 25 years of age to 45 years of age. Yep. Now, what we look at here is obviously uh, the average Australian and then you know, their bucket is a representation of their bank account. Now, 25, we know that we're making a little bit of money. 35, we should be making more than what we were at 25. And 45, we believe we start to enter the peak of our career. I think that's pretty straightforward. So we've just got a lot of different dollar signs in here, but we've got two little leakages over here. Mm. Now those two leakages, they do represent two things that we are absolutely guaranteed in life. And about 50% of the people that I deal with get this right. So death and taxes, all right? <laughs> but I do always cross out the word death and I replace that with the word mortgage. Because For I a very good reason. Yeah. Oh, Sean, can you explain to them? Sure, well mortgage in, in French actually almost translates to the word death pledge. Yeah. And every time you go past a street that's named Mort Street, it actually means Death Street. Yeah, so you're on the green mile there. Yeah, mate. That, I Sorry for I all know those that. guys who live on Mort Street in Blacktown. Now your values just crashed by 50%. <laughs> Let's buy. Let's buy. <laughs> like, mate, that's the beauty about real estate. Actually, I'm going to jump in on that point. That's what I love about real estate, that Elon Musk can't just wake up tomorrow morning mm. and send something from the moon to the Mars. I don't know, whatever new... Mate, uh, if you're a millennial <laughs> and watching this... No, actually, not millennial. What are they now? Gen Z? Gen Z. Yeah, something. I'm getting old. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mate, but that is that I didn't know that. Mm. Yeah. Well, I can see that. Like, if you get a mortgage at thirty and average mortgage repayment, most people are never going to pay off their mortgage. To be, let's be real. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to come to that. Event. I'm going to really. This out. Oh gonna, yeah. yeah. Let's I'm do it. I'm going to draw that it. out. I'm going to explain to you as well. But look, just quickly, we're going to cross out death. We're going to keep talking about mortgage in there. Now, yeah. either comes in the form of rent or mortgage when it comes to living in civilization. I think we can all agree with that. Yes. Now. We know that it represents our two leakages here. I think we can all agree if we've all got a mortgage, which we do, right? It is probably the largest expense partnered up with our taxes, month to month. Do you know the amount of times I've heard people say to me, if, if I didn't have my mortgage, mm. I would have start up my, started my dream business. If I didn't have my mortgage, mm. I would have gone and upskilled and taken up the job opportunity. If I didn't have my mortgage, mm -hmm. I would have bought a couple more investment properties. If I didn't have my mortgage, I could send my kids to a better school. Mm. Because a lot of people are now forced to buy in bum suburbs, mm. respectfully, mm -hmm. um, that might not have the amenities and the facilities that you want, but you can't move because you're committed to a large mortgage and often, because the cash flow is so poor in these assets, they can't even rent vest at this well, point because... Sorry, you know what we're seeing as well that we don't realise because we're just every day doing our thing. We're, we're going through, at least here in Sydney, gentrification. Mm -hmm. that we're, we mm. don't accept, right? We, mm. oh, we talk about it, we know what it means, but we're not accepting of it. Yeah. Right? yeah. But we're seeing people that are within our networks of friends that are moving out past you know, the outskirts of Sydney border. Right. So you start to look at it and you go, hmm, okay, well, it's, it's nice. It's not too close to the city. It's okay. They don't need to go to the city for work anymore. But who cares? If they had the option to buy closer to the city, would they? 100% mm. they would. Probably would. All right. So I'll keep moving forward. But look, the, the, the mortgage and the taxes, all right, out of those two, I think it's pretty clear to know that we can close off the mortgage first because we can pay that off first. All right. Taxes, we always have a bit of a joke and we understand that we can never pay them off first, otherwise we end up going to jail. Right. <laughs> which which we don't advise doing. No, not at all. Tax mitigation is a strategy, tax evasion is a crime. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Well what I've done here is saying that look, we usually have a big hole in tax, but a lot of people don't realise there's there's a lot of what we like to say, money left on the table. Hundred percent. Right? Where tax is a game in itself. And I actually just spoke about that only an hour ago before this session. But I'll keep moving on. I want to show you guys as well another quick one. It's just a quick timeline. All right, and this is based on the average Australian. Again, mm. not made up by us. This is fact. So 25, 35, 45, and 75 years of age is what I've got here. We earn a bit of money at 25, we earn more at 35, and we earn the most at 45. Agreed? Yep, yep. On average, so, yep. On average, yep. So at 35, I think we can all say that we probably would fall into the bucket, the average Australian, of buying our first home. Correct. Yes. Yes, a few factors yep. cause that. Family, we're kicking off a family. We're, we're earning more money. We're in a position now where we've got about 10 years. We should have 10 years in our chosen field of work. Actually, yeah. just speaking of which, I've, I've 
this is something I've been hearing very commonly. And I asked them, why did you buy this house? Mm. And they just go, oh, I was getting, I was settling down. We, <laughs> we, were, we were getting married at all. Um, we decided to have start a family yep. and we were settling down. So I said, right, so you were trying to have a kid and mm. then you decided to sign up for a 30 or million dollar mortgage on a mm. place you don't like. Mm. And they just go, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it, it totally makes sense. I was having a kid, so I just borrowed a million dollars for a place that I don't really like. Yeah, it's, sure. it's, it's sad. It's sad because people don't know any better. Mm. which is unfortunate. But what we see here... That's where the empathy in, comes in. See, yeah. that's why we love, we love him. <laughs> but now I've got to get hard with you guys. <laughs> so we know that we're buying our first home, mm. right, at 35. Now, another 10 years goes on, and we know that at 45, we're entering the peak of our career. We're starting to make moves, but we've also got a second wind of life. I can tell you now, when I'm in my 40s, I'll probably have that second wind of life. Absolutely. My son... He's, he's killing me right now. He's making it very tired. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it, it, it's when we see a lot of people come back out again and they've, they've, just, they've just hit that second win. So they go out and they're keeping up with the Kardashians, as we like to joke around, <laughs> and they go out and they buy the bigger and better house. Yep. We know that it comes with the bigger mortgage all yep. the time. All right? So I'll put a little dollar sign there. But one thing, again, the sad part out of all of this is that most Australians are taking their mortgage until 75. Okay? And do you guys know how long it takes to pay off the average mortgage? 39, 39, 39 pretty, years. Pretty crazy. Every time I ask that question as well, I always get the answer, oh, 20, 25. 15, 20, yeah. And I wish it was the case. It probably was the case maybe 20, 30 no, years ago. No, but Barefoot and Master said that if you put $50... <laughs> Well, don't worry, our clients are paying off their mortgages in less than less than 12 and 10, so that's great. Well, that's that's the thing. And then what we want to do is you know, find out where you want to retire. But Stop then, drinking almond cappuccinos and avocado toast. But what right? we can Unless see, you make half a million a year, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and what so we I can hear. see here is, you know, it, it really, if we're buying a mortgage at 35, we're taking it to 75, there's already 40 years there. All right, just on this little chart here alone. So, you know, uh, I actually wanted to turn to, to leverage, and I want to give that to Sean as well to, to have a talk about, if, if that's... A uh, hundred percent. So, the reason leverage is important, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, is the idea of leverage is to use, ladies and gentlemen, for you guys who... It's a fancy term for being able to use other people's money, mm. or other people's time sometimes, um, to be able to take your one dollar and make it look like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 that's what big business do, do, do or that's what banks do mm. um and the only way actually i'm gra glad you br br brought that up is to beat this cycle where mm. mate if i just follow this for the rest of my life it is it is one thing is guaranteed i'm going to die broke mm -hmm. right the only way to turn that around is make my money go hard for me and because I'm in such a tight spot, and when I say I, the average person, yep. is in such a tight spot, they have not enough money mm. to be able to go out there and get the sufficient exposure. Mm. So you need leverage that takes maybe your savings or your equity or whatever whatever it might be and make magnifies it, if you will. Mm. Right? It's like taking it's like taking a hundred dollars and printing it a hundred times on the, on the photocopy, that's illegal, don't do yeah. that. Um, don't do that, but you, you get the idea. It's about taking your hundred dollar bill and making it look like thousand, two thousand, five thousand, yep. three times, five times, so on and so forth. And people get scared of that. Mm. People get scared of that and people don't understand how it works. And it is very important for you to understand and get your head around it. Um, and for that, Sean, we'll lean on you, mate. Can you, can you please give our audience a basic understanding of how money works and why leverage is important and the power of leverage. Sure. Kesh, Mark, thank you both so much. Um, every time I talk about leverage, well, we'll see, I, I generally start with, in Australia, we're blessed to be in a country where uh, people love property. We know it's worth roughly nine trillion in the resi market, surpassing the likes of your commercial market, ASX, so forth, so on. Mm -hmm. It's the, the bread and butter of where a lot of people hold and foster their wealth building. Can, can right? I try something? Can Absolutely. Try something? Absolutely. Um, so, producer Anna, if we can do this, $9 trillion is residential real estate, $2 trillion is ASX, $2 trillion is super fun, and $1 trillion commercial. So if you add up commercial, ASX, and super, it's $5 trillion versus nine. Mm. So residential is a massive part. And guys, mums and dads, Sean, you've got such a valid point. This is mums and dads money. Sure. This, is, this is not some hedge fund manager, billionaire, mm -hmm. Who, this is mums and dads, the average person, they've parked, they've chosen to park their money over the years in Australian real estate. This is their favorite asset class. 
hundred yeah. percent. And don't get me wrong, people that are wealthy do bang in the in the sheds with with property as well. They love it. Oh, yeah. um, different levels to the game. So if you guys want to check out levels to the game, just check out some of the previous episodes we've already done. Yeah. Now, when I ask people the question, which is why property? Like why property in the first place? I just get usually these responses. So it's safe. I get the response that it's uh, you know a growing sort of asset class. So growth generally tends to be healthy. I love this iPad so much, Kesh. I think it's like magic. I've been missing out on some amazing piece of tech my whole life. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at your writing and I look like I'm a baby compared to you. Mate, it, it's a game changer. I haven't even written in six months, uh, so I'm giving Apple, it a try. Apple, but I've you, tried to be you fancy. Can sponsor me. Yeah, <laughs> notability. <laughs> so I, I get, for example, you know, uh, uh, safe, uh, let's say, yep, growth, yep. Uh, we get the idea of less volatile because a lot of people want to keep their cash safe. Of mm. course. Uh, why else property? You know, it's income producing. Oh, I love it. Uh, you're always getting rental. And of course, if you're not buying in the middle of nowhere, you're generally getting a decent return. Now, this isn't the real reason we're coaching people to be property investors. Let mm. that be known. It's not because of these reasons. Otherwise, what's the difference between, you know, a, a property and stocks? And here's, here's what we're trying to get at. The real reason property makes sense is most people on average that I work with these days have a spare 100K either lying as a savings account buffer. Mm. Losings a, account buffer. Losings account buffer. Yeah. There's no such thing as a savings one. account. It's called a losings account, ladies and gentlemen. We have to salute the uh, <laughs> Mr. Bill, Bill, Bill Gender. <laughs> Billionaire <laughs> advice piece over there. Losings account. Now, uh, I love it because it's true. Now, let's say if we're just taking a very rough example of capital you have that you can deploy into a variety of different asset classes. Mm. We're mm -hmm. going to use the example of one hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Now, with one hundred thousand dollars, most people actually leave it in that losings account, which is also known as savings in Australia. Mm -hmm. And savings in Australia generally, if you're lucky, pays you one percent. Mm. And with one percent, what happens is because it's generally earned income you're earning approximately $1,000 on your original 100K. Yep. Now, the sad part is everyone's generally working full-time. If you are working full-time, you're paying taxes. Now, the ATO taxes you straight away on that interest earned in the savings account anyway. So yep. we end up paying taxes. That is true. That is true. You get, you get hit with tax first. And apart yep. from paying taxes, your real return on investment is actually, funnily enough, less than... I'm running out of space here. That's my bad easier on the computer but your return on investment is less than one percent when mm. you just leave cash and savings Wait, i reckon you got you should just highlight that let's go yellow and highlight the one percent boom mm. draw go. this looks good you you're making me very excited <laughs> i need to just become a full-time lecturer and just do this all the time now, i love it i love the it. next level is where go back to pen yep and the next level is where people end up saying okay what can i do that's better now We've coached people on what offset accounts are, how it works, and so forth, so on. So when you've got an offset account, it generally works the same as what equity or an offset cash out would do. So equity and offset is generally helping you save money that you're not using at the rate of what your mortgage is costing you. Mm. Now, the benefit of an offset account is generally if we use a 2.5% mortgage rate, mm. that means you're saving per annum approximately 2,500 per annum. Yep. Now, when you're saving 2,500 per annum, what it means is you don't pay tax on that. Because you're saving it, right? So an offset account, which is literally the same facility as a savings account, just a different place to keep the same money you have, mm. you're straight away so earning a 2.5% so, return. So what you're investment. saying to me is if I've got a mortgage that I'm paying, say, two point something on, or whatever you're paying, and if I put money in there, I'm saving 2% instead of earning 0.35% exactly. in the losings account. Exactly. Which, I don't know how the, that's taxed. The number of, number of families that have cash lying around all over the place, like the buckets oh, in when they're saying a hundred the different places. The just-in-case cash. The just-in-case cash. It's the same cash. Put it in the offset account. It's mm. going to save you a lot Guys, more, I'll, right? I'll, just to jump in there, job seekers, job keepers, business, mate, we, country has got a very good support system overall. Mm. It really does. So I don't think our buffer is important. Yes. 200 grand, 150 grand a buffer. I don't think so. It depends. If you're a business owner where you have high risk, high volatility, sure. Oh, yes. Keep a quarter of a million dollar buffer. Yep. If you're a family that has literally That's zero- That's chest money. <laughs> if, if you're a family that has a you know a general set of living, keep a three, six month buffer a year at worst. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. apart from that, you just get into crazy territory. Now, for a family that has, you know, a hundred grand disposable in either offset, oops, I'm gonna go back there. 
Yep. For a family that has either a hundred grand that's that's disposable sitting in the offset or savings, the general next level to help grow the money is taking it into a level which is generally your shares. Oops. Do you I know why that does that? The funny thing is, we need to go back a bit. Back. The funny back. thing is, if you double tap this, it goes to Razor. You double tap this, it comes back to Pen. Mm. Right. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a quick iPad tip for you right there. <laughs> Technology, saving my life day in, day out. Day okay. in, day out. Now with shares in managed funds, you've got a situation where this is what families used to now start growing their wealth because they're sick of just earning two and a half, one and a half, whatever percent it might be. So yep. with shares, now there are reasons of why we do property. So we know about these, right? But with regards to shares, a lot of people say, no, I don't want to do shares, Sean, because it's volatile. I don't want to do shares because maybe it's, you know, if I park 100 grand in there and I check the value tomorrow and it's only 85 grand, most average families would have a mini heart attack. They'd go, what happened to our shares? Now, with, with an average... This is what happened. Exactly. Now, with an average healthy return, even if you buy your boring stocks, you're comfortably looking at achieving 8% growth. Mm. Now with 8%, that gives you about $8,000 per annum. And this is not saying, you know, if you bought during the COVID crash and you multiplied it where you tripled it and doubled it, oh, this is uh, just a uh, long-term uh, average. Are the, are the pro day traders, is it? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of pro day <laughs> traders out there that at the moment are sitting on 30, 40, 50% growth. But at the end of the day, of course, that's not sustainable every single year. Now with 8%, $8,000, of course, having a return on investment of 8% is much better than having it on 2.5% or 1% in savings. Fair enough. Yep. Now, here's where the kicker comes in. Now, this is just an average example that I've used with returns from super, shares, managed funds, and so forth and so on. But property is the next step where people say, okay, you know, JRPP, Mark, Kesh, you guys are the property guys. Why should I do property? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the real reason you do property because 100 grand can actually be leveraged at 90%. Can By leveraging at 90%. Can explain that to our audience. What is 100 grand leverage at 90? What does that mean? So it just pretty much means that 100 grand can act like 10% of your market value you can put forth into the marketplace. So 100 grand, leverage at 90%, and basically I can go get another 900 grand. Correct. And basically look, make my 100 grand look like a million dollars. Investable in the marketplace. So that's the bare bones of it. But using this $100,000 example, because we have to pay for stamp duties, mm -hmm. because we have to pay for a few legals, we're going to use that the fact that 90% leverage gets us controlling an 8 hundred thousand dollar asset because i've taken away the stamp duty on the land so forth so on now with eight hundred thousand dollars here's the thing in capital cities we're averaging growth rates of about seven percent across the board long-term mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. but when my mentor shared this example with me he mm. said sean conservatively worst case what do you expect property to grow long term i know the answer and this is globally in capital cities for you guys to know real estate is the only investment and there's a good quick fact in capital cities, again, dynamic economies, APIE. If you haven't watched that, watch another episode. But have the only asset that is consistently kept up with inflation, reason being, the cost of land, the cost of bricks, the cost of labor, the replacement value keeps up with inflation. So if inflation is two and a half, three percent, there's always been a percentage above that. So right now inflation is through the roof, but normally it's two and a half, three percent in Australia. So say a four percent or five percent return would be bare minimum, but I'll take at least inflation three percent. Sure, perfect. Now, just so that going back to the drawing board here, imagine this, guys. With 800 grand, okay, so now assuming that we've got 7% growth, my mentor asked me this question Sean, worst case, what do you really think property is going to grow long term? And I said, worst case, probably 5%. And uh, I'll ask you both the same question, gentlemen. Worst case, if it's always done 7% plus in Australia, worst case, what do you both think it's going to grow long term? Conservatively. I'd say 4%. Conservative? Same. Same. Yeah, Very nice percent. and said. Great. So my mentor actually asked me this. He goes, um, Sean, do you think property will at least grow 4% long term? And I said, uh, yeah, it should. I mean, it, it definitely should. If it's always done 7, then 4% is very safe. And then he asked me the strangest thing. Can I just jump in there very quickly? To give people context here, um, we're not pulling out these numbers from thin air or just making weird assumptions. Uh, I've got a whole video on and I don't know if we've done it on Friday Night Live or not, but I will do um, a whole video on why real estate works and in Australia and why it's worth $9 trillion and why it will not fail and it's how it's part of the government's larger plan. Anyway, coming back to this, so I don't want you guys to think we're just pulling out numbers from nowhere. There's a lot of context behind that. In the interest of time, we're trying to give you as much info as possible. Pow, punch. Pow, pow. Pow, <laughs> puff, gills. Sorry, mate. Keep going. No, no, 100%. That's all good. So, definitely. So, uh, then he asked me the strangest question, which is Sean. 
do you think property will at least grow at 3% long term? And then I thought something weird's going on here. Mm. I thought for a second this is a bit strange because, of course, it has to. I know that inflation is pretty much touching that figure anyway. So property mm. has to perform a couple of ticks above. Now, if property performs a couple of ticks above that, he said, let's go with 3% for the example. I said, okay, great. He asked me, Sean, what was your return on investment? Now, if anyone wants to pull out a calculator or if you at home who's watching this or if you're driving, if you want to have a think about it, take a guess at what your real return on investment is in property. And keep in mind, there is a little bonus piece to add to this at the end, but your return on investment is actually not 3% because the capital investment was 100 grand. What you did was you controlled an asset with 800 grand, which means your profit was $24,000, right? So you made 24 grand of growth, even if the property only grew at 3%. That means your return on investment was actually the 24 grand on the original capital invested, which was actually 24% return on investment. So you're saying on my $100,000, I'm getting 24%. 24% return on your cash, even if your properties only grow at 3%. Just, just so you guys have context, um, as compound interest goes, just a quick fact, if you can grow your money at 7% per annum, just 7% per annum, um, you double your money every 10 years. 24% is is just ridiculous in and predominantly very safe mum and dad mm. asset class. Like it's, yeah. again, conditions apply like you say, if you're gonna go buy in some bum town in the middle of nowhere, mm. different story, but we're talking like fundamental capital cities, that is crazy, 24%. It's ridiculous because Here's, here's the other thing that, that holds people back. They go, oh, but Sean, what about the mortgage? What about the rental? What about, what about the tenants? What if there's no this, that? If your property is structured correctly, it does not need to cost you out of your pocket. No, oh, I've, I've got an explanation for that. Yeah, 100%. And we'll do plenty of workshops on this um, in, in future episodes and past mm. episodes. We've already covered so many elements, but mm. if it's structured correctly, it really does need to cost you out of your pocket. Yep. So think about it this way. If, if you truly grasp this, uh, wherever you listen to this, this is the real reason why we're doing property. A hundred grand didn't change. A hundred grand was the same. But in savings, it literally only garners us a percent or less than a percent of growth because mm. you pay the taxes. In equity and offset, it's two and a half percent, which means your return is two and a half percent. With shares, if that's growing at eight percent, your return's eight percent. But with property, because of leverage, you control the eight hundred grand. Even if that's only growing at three percent, your cash on cash return is twenty four percent. So if that sinks in, worst case, that's what you should be looking at targeting on your property sort of investment. So um, that's the real reason why we why we do property and. Um, uh, every time I share this example, there, there are those that understand the concepts of leverage, that understand how money works. And if you can truly grasp this, you should be maximizing your leverage every single time. Because if we don't do it, buying property is the same as buying a stock. Why don't we just go buy CBA shares? Because we're not buying properties in cash for a hundred grand. Mm. We're it's, utilizing it. Right? We're, we're utilizing it. And, and uh, you, you've touched on something really, really important that um, I'd, I'd like to go through. So it's it's the psychology of debt, right? So the way I learned investing um, is there's risk-free stuff. So risk-free usually is government bonds, um, losings account, whatever you might call it, right? Whatever you might call it. And I know that I can get 0.35%. I don't know what government bonds are doing at the moment. Don't would you, care. Would you, would you include Shiba coin in there as well? Yep, that is absolute <laughs> Shiba Inu. <laughs> Oh, whatever it is. Dogecoin. Dogecoin, whatever it is, right? <laughs> Risk-free. So, so I know, in this very simple example, risk-free, if I put savings account here, I know for a fact that, okay, on $100,000, I'm getting 0.35 of a percent. So I'm getting about $350 minus tax. So $245. Mm. And if I divide that by 52, so definitely $4.70 per week, um, which is great. Um, that's your Almond Cappuccino. There we go. We still did better than the almost free barefoot bonus. investor. Mm. <laughs> right? Again, when I talk about taking on risk, taking on risk, that means I'm obviously what you said, Sean, the whole idea of taking on risk is to be able to beat inflation because what you showed us, Mark, was basically people's wages or business income normally is not going up. Um, as quickly as cost of living is going up. So mm. when I used to hear people older to me say, oh, you know what, in my time I could buy this for 20 cents and now, yep. and it's just, just, I'm like, what are they on about? Like, 
what are they on about? And, I, and soon you realize that this piece of paper um, that, that we value so much, that the government just prints, is losing value on a yearly basis. So mm. what $100,000 used to really buy you doesn't buy you that stuff anymore, right? Yeah. So if you look at the cost of cars, grocery, homes today, um, inflation is through the roof, mm -hmm. right? And this is creating a massive divide between the rich and the poor who have, have a lot and who don't. And the government can't do anything about this, right? As much as they might try and alter, but it happens everywhere in every developing economy or developed economy. Now, speaking of leverage, uh, a lot of people in the audience would would think about, oh, there's this, this cost and there's that cost and so on and so forth. And this is how I look at it. There's four lines. Oh, I love this one. This one's going to be good. There are four lines when I it comes to I can't believe you drew that line so well. Very, very <laughs> You're a beast. Yes. So there are four lines when it comes to any sort of making money, right? So I'm going to take my spare money. Usually, you're going to take your spare money to put it into places better than a losings account, if you will, right? Because that's what the banks do. They'll take your 10 grand and rent it out to someone at 18%. Yep. Exactly. Right? They're, they're taking your money saying, mate, here's your card. And I'm going to rent this money. And they'll charge you account keeping fees. How <laughs> damn they? <laughs> Sometimes the account keeping fees are more than the money you're earning on it. But anyway, I'm done bagging out the banks today. <laughs> if you want a free bank account. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say this is a purchase price. Okay. So whether, whether you're buying Rolexes, whether you buy a business, whether you're buying real estate, whatever it might be. All right. There's a purchase price to anything. You buy a car, anything. There's a purchase price. Okay. Mm -hmm. For every purchase price, say, and again, this is applicable to anything, whether you're doing business, whether you, anything, right? There is a red line on top, and this red line is an ongoing cost. There is a line of cost that might increase or decrease slightly, so there'll be fixed costs and variable costs and so on and so forth. I won't go into too much, but there's a cost, there's a red line. So if you buy a car cash, you still got to pay rego, you still got to service, you still got to put fuel in it. For missed excuses or things, oh, I drive a Tesla, you got to pay electricity bill. Yeah, Mr. Excuses, <laughs> sit the hell down. Mate, shh. Anyway. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mr. Excuses will always have something to say, but well, we don't need cars anyway. We don't see them. Mate, e even you. Home. I work from home forever. That's right. When you've got electricity internet. bills, right? Then calm down. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, oh, I have solar power. Well, you had to pay for the solar, didn't you? Shut up. <laughs> so there's always ongoing costs. You know, you've got to pressure spray your solar from, from all the bird poo. So yeah. <laughs> there's always a cost. Doesn't matter how you cut it. There's a cost to breathe. Absolutely. There is, right? Now, the idea of investing and what you said was, what you covered was a purchase price. So you were saying, hey, Cash, if you've got $100, you can maybe take another... I don't know, $600, or you can take another $800, or you can take another $1,000 or whatever, and make it look like it's much bigger. So your purchase price is a thousand bucks. So you're going, mate, I'm mm. putting big, I'm going big. Go big or go home, right? Mm. And it sounds really great in the movies, but we want to be sensible about this, Correct. right? And the assumption here, assumption here, guys, is that in the future, one day in the future, that whether that future, like again, you can say 10 years, 15 years, those timelines can be set depending on what it is. If it's a business, if it is an investment, shares, real estate, in the future, what people want is if I park my money somewhere, it should increase in value. So that is a future market value. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a school of thought where there is future market value is rubbish. You can, even when it comes to shares, um, you can do earnings per share and this and that and fundamental, mate, it's perception. At the end of the day, what is the perception? Tesla is a very, very good example or these modern day valuations of companies that lose money year on year. Yep. Yeah, ridiculous. Um, it's perception value. So it could be market share, how people perceive it, so on and so forth. So Mark, let me ask you this, right? So why, why do people pay, right? And there's a very simple answer. Why do people pay for a three bedroom house in Vaucluse or Point? Without water views, I'm just talking normal house. Mm -hmm. Why does a three bedroom house with no parking in Vaucluse cost more than a brand new four two and two, say in Oran Park? Or um, I'm not even going Claymore Mount Druid, or even even for that matter, good suburbs like like your your Marsdens and so on and so your newer suburbs that have come in. 
You know what I mean? Sometimes mm -hmm. you see three or four bedroom apartments sell for more price that more, are more expensive than houses in Castle Hill, yep. which is a fundamentally good suburb. And mm -hmm. the only reason for that is perception. Correct. Right? And and you can you can talk about proximity to the city, you can do this, but again, proximity to the city, the all of these factors is perception of that asset. Like, you know, Wentworth Will's close to Parramatta. So why isn't Wentworth Will like $8 million. It, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think where perception, like Rolexes versus Casios, you know, you can buy a stainless steel Rolex for 13500 at at your authorized retailer. You can literally walk out and sell it for eight, ten, fifteen thousand. 15000 It's a stainless steel watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we saw today. Rolex today, actually, which for uh, retail well, was, was about $8,000, $9,000, and it was for sale at, one a, you've got. at a dealership for uh, fifteen grand. Is it 2015? I don't know. Oh, we'll yeah. won't get distracted. More, more on this later. Okay. So, <laughs> Sign somewhere here. So, yeah. speaking of which, there's a very important line that I've left out here. Yep. This is a line which I call sleep at night factor line. Mm -hmm. And this is the income that this asset is generating. So when I look at why I don't apply this to say normally to cars or to other art pieces and so on and so forth, very rarely, unless you're renting out your art pieces or you have a gallery or you know, you're renting out your watches or your car, there's no ongoing income from it. So usually your, your blue line income is below the ongoing cost yes. or it, it doesn't exist at all, yep. right? And often what happens is if you don't have the blue line with whatever as asset you've purchased, mm -hmm. it gets harder to hold it for its maturity, mm. right? So if I buy a property today and let's say it's a million dollars and I borrow like you've said, but if my rent does not cover the mortgage repayments or the, the property management fees or the vacancy or landlord's insurance, council rates, whatever it might be, it'll get harder and harder and harder for me to hold this asset and it will not allow me to hold it long enough for me to see the growth, the overall growth in that asset, mm -hmm. right? Now, this timeline, there are multiple factors of why it will grow and how much it will grow by, but this is where people go wrong with the leverage, mm -hmm. right? And this is where people need to be really careful. The time your blue line drops below the red, Wow, this is I'm rising. just going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that guy on Antiques Roadshow who falls off the falls off thin air into the ground. Whoa. We'll get that on the blue screen. We will, we okay, will. so this is what we're talking about. <laughs> just fall. That's me right now. <laughs> keep, but, keep going. I love this. But when this happens, irrespective of what the future value, the perceived value of that asset is going to be, gets harder and harder to be, for people to hold. Mm. So. When we talk about leverage, where I see a lot of people go wrong is they don't understand where their red line is, where their blue line is. Now, whether I buy a property for five hundred thousand dollars in Sydney, whether I buy a property for and the guys, I'm talking about real estate because that's what we do, that's what I do, that's what I understand, that's my circle of competence, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. um, whether I buy five hundred thousand dollar property in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, I owe five hundred thousand dollars to the bank. They're not going to charge me a different rate because I'm, I'm in a different city. If the bank's interest rate is X, Y, Z, and they're happy to lend 90% in that particular suburb, um, and it's not gonna sink or disappear or do some weird stuff, um, and there's not lending risk, I will get a very similar rate to someone else, mm, right? Whether, where, irrespective of where the property is. And property management fees might be percentage here or there, it's very similar, and landlord's insurance might be $100 here or there, very similar, and every, everything has got a red line. Where people often go wrong with such low interest rates right now is a lot of purchases are made, including your own mortgage, where you've made a purchase and in the future, you might have an X value of this asset, mm. but you are below the red line because it's not generating any income for you and you're constantly putting money into this property. Mm. And eventually you don't you're not left with any more money. So what happens is unfortunately people will spend 30, 40 years paying off this dream home or whatever it is, just to realize in the end, they're so broke, they have to sell this home finally. So for me, I, I look at it the other way. I rather live in an area that I really like and rent a property for a nominal price. So you can rent a $3 million property. Sydney has got the worst rental yield for 1.8% of its value <laughs> or less. Um, and I rather put my money in places where the perceived value or the market value will grow in the future, but not only that, it allows me to hold or control more of the leverage or the debt, if you will, 
by having my blue line above the red line because someone else is paying for my leverage. So mm. I've parked my 100 grand getting that 24% return, but someone else is footing the bill. Mm. And if I can if I can do that and say your home that you've purchased for a million dollars becomes $4 million in the next 30 years, imagine instead of paying that down over 30 years, if I bought four more properties like that with 100 grand each and control mm. them, that means I'm sitting on $16 million Versus four million dollars in debt. It's ridiculous. I would love to try one little thing with the iPad. One hundred percent. Go for it before we wrap up. I hope that made sense. Because okay, mm. this okay. makes so much sense. Because you're so right, Kesh. Who funds it? I've learnt my tricks. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I yes. got a perfect circle. That's pretty oh. cool. Who's actually funding it? Is there's you? Yep. Mm. Funding all that debt. Who's funding the rest? Taxes and tenants. That's right. That is right. Actually, we maximizing. Should, well, that gives me an idea. Guys, if you're really interested, um, we can do a live cash flow analysis to really break down the factors of non-cash cash deductions if that adds value. But long story short, please do not follow the default future. Like yeah. Walmart, it, it is scary. And the, the, the scariest part is it's inevitable. Yep. It is inev- if you don't do anything today, nothing's going to change for us magically. And we all know that. You take control, you take responsibility. We talk about that often. Get your head around debt. And if debt scares you, it should. Please don't take... But what, what's funny is people are happy to, to get a car loan. Mm. They're happy to get a million dollar mortgage. But they're not happy to buy something with the same debt, which will actually make them money. Which I, I, I just don't understand. So you'll borrow a million dollars mm. or you'll borrow 50 grand for a car... Your home does not make any money. Blue line doesn't exist in your home. Mm. Okay. Um, Mr. Excuse me, I have a granny flat. Mate, doesn't matter. <laughs> Mr. Excuse me, just sit down. <laughs> and then and then you've got <laughs> then you've got you've got people who are buying cars or other things, you know? Holidays on credit cards and that sort of stuff. So I just find it crazy where these people are refusing to take the red line, where the blue line can sit on top and they can control multiple Asset, income generating assets so you're not you're not delaying your gratification you're actually getting it as you go so you're getting it back in tax you're getting it back in sometimes positive cash flow um, and of course capital growth so irrespective of where capital growth is whether it happens in 10 years 15 years 20 years it's better than leaving money in the bank it, it really is especially right now look I wouldn't argue this if my savings was giving me 15, 20 percent, mm. but it's not. And that's the reality. The whole world is sitting here. Japan's on negative interest rates. So if you really want to break the default future, this is why the rich get richer. 100 percent. And what you got to understand is everything you guys are doing today um, for for yourself, your your decisions about the red line, blue line don't affect you, just affect the next generation. And and just this year alone, guys, just quick fact before we wrap up 70 trillion dollars has been passed down to the next generation. So while you're sitting there struggling with your mortgage, there's going to be a 25 year old <laughs> who's going to go to a very good perceived value because granddad left him a $10 million property mm-hmm. um, nice. and they've split it amongst three grandchildren and they're going to be buying stuff cash. So if, if you live in this misconception of, oh, how much further far can it go? Well, people were buying houses in Castle Hill 40 years ago for six grand. That's right. Um, so. There is, there is some sense to this. You will not be able to save yourself wealthy. Um, please, um, public service announcement. If it's not real estate, something else. But you've got to really understand it. You've got to understand that you've got to make your money work for you. The first step is to make money. And the second step is to put that money to actually put, put, put it to work. Mm. Where you're not a slave to money. And money actually works for you. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, we covered the basic metrics on investing the blueprint of understanding the fundamentals. Hope you guys got value. Please give us your comments. Give us your your feedback. Um, share, subscribe. Um, share this video with someone who you think will get value out of it. And if there's some unanswered questions, that is perfect. We did that on purpose. So you, you ask those questions and you add value to others, I guess. Um, but on that note, we do you want to do rapid rock? We have one awesome question for you both. Mate, let's do rapid yeah, robins. Let's do rapid that. robins. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never forget. That's the good thing. So rapid round robins, always piece of the cake. Mm-hmm. What is, Kesh, the worst advice you have ever received? Ooh. And I know this one's a stunner. 
Worst advice I've ever received. Take life seriously. Really? Mm. Wow. That's awesome. We need a story on that. Take life seriously. You don't know how serious it is. <laughs> and it was given to me by Mr. Excuses. I'm oh, like, mate, Mr. Excuses. I'll tell you what. <laughs> my life, as serious as it gets, I enjoy it. The only thing that's going to get you is a serial killer. <laughs> that's how serious it's going to get. So anyway, oh, that's, that's the worst advice. That's a cool one. I don't know what... Is that... Are we fine? It's a ticking time bomb. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Mr. Excuses planted us. <laughs> Mate, Quick. this always happens. Every one hour episode, something happens. Anyway, it's something fun. What about you? Worst advice? Well, as I have probably said before, how long do we have for this answer? But uh, I think it was, don't buy the Lamborghini. <laughs> don't worst Don't advice. buy the Lamborghini? Mate. Someone gave you that advice? <laughs> yes, and it hurt <laughs> a lot. <laughs> oh, is it one of those people, where are you going to drive it? Was it one of those? Yeah, we won't go into it, but it was, um, it was one mate, of we those. Mate, we, we got to do a lengthier story on this. Don't buy the Lamborghini. This is weird, like literally the three of us are going to be zooming around the town in literally... Lamborghinis, but anyway, uh, that, that's a different different <laughs> question for it. But anyway, Guys, thanks so much. Guys, first, show. don't buy a Lambo. What about you? Worst advice ever. Worst piece of advice I ever got in my life was get into that graduate program and give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are you doing with? <laughs> Just get into the grad program. Come on. <laughs> sure. That, that's gonna. That's that. That's definitely gonna give you a very very different future. Yeah. On that note, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Friday Night Live. We love you. Thank you for supporting us for so long. Hope you enjoyed our episode 13. We tried our best. Sean 14. almost... 14. This We're is 14. 14. Yeah. The previous one was 13, which yeah. I hope you guys you enjoyed really that. Too quick. Because, mate, it has gone really quick because we almost suffocated Mark and Sean. Yeah. Um, Mark almost passed out in that episode. So if you haven't watched episode 13, that was covered Friday Night Live. The horror episode and bonus footage. I don't know if we can get that up. And we got to have a video of Mark just passing out. Yeah, we'll get some bonus footage of that. I reckon it's a wrap. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, boy. Beast. Thank you, sir. Bye for now.